Good morning. morning. Everybody ready this morning? Cool. We're going to jump right in. We are in the third week of our series entitled Out With the Old. If you are new and this is your first Sunday at Living Water, uh, my name is Tony. I get to be one of the co-pastors here at Living Water and I get to share and sort of lead through this series. And I've been excited by this. If you want to get a Bible out or get your phone and um, you can scan that QR code in the chairs in front of you, that'll take you to our website. There's an area on there that has sermon notes that'll give you everything that you see on the screen today, also the scriptures that are there. But if you want to go ahead and take them out, we're going to be in Romans chapter 12. Everybody say Romans 12. Go. All right, you know where we are. We're in Romans 12. You have no excuse. You're going to be there. You are warm. You are inside of a building. It is, shoot, it has warmed up to 24 degrees already. Can y'all believe that? Woo, heat wave. I told a couple of people that I've been on staff here or a pastor here for like 16, 17 years, and this morning is the very first first morning in all that time that I made sure that all three thermostats backstage for y'all are set on heat. uh, Yeah. So are all of y'all warm this morning? Are you warm? Okay. If any of you are not warm, then buy a blanket and put it on you when you come in. Amen? Amen. All right, we're going to dig in this morning. This series has been um, challenging. Um, It's been fun, but it's also been one of those things that's kind of in our faces and a recognition that if we're ever going to be in the new that God has for us, then we have to get rid of the old. We have to be out with the old in our lives. We've been hanging in Romans chapter 12, and we'll continue to hang there this morning, but I want to kind of catch you up if you weren't part of this in the previous weeks, or maybe you were, and you just want to kind of get that uh, intro back into it again. We've been answering a couple of questions. The first week, we answered or asked this question, what are you holding on to that God is asking you to let go of? What is that thing you're holding on to? I ask you to identify it. Part of the reason I ask you to identify it is we started last month. Monday, our 21 days of prayer and fasting as a church. How many of you are participating in the 21 days of prayer and fasting? You've made it about six days. Hey, that's a bunch of y'all. That's cool. Um, how many of y'all are hanging with it? You're doing well. You're okay. How many of you are hangry? Um, how many of you, one of our staff, one of our staff members, I'm not going to say who it is, Crystal. I'm not going to say who it is. She is giving up coffee for her 21 days of fasting, and I work with her every single morning, and I do not appreciate her fast in any way what's, I'm teasing, Crystal is wonderful and sweet all the time, Um, but she also works with her husband, so that's, yeah, anyway, all right, so, um, but everybody's got things we're, we're giving up and things that we're saying, God, we want it to draw to you. Part of that first week was asking ourselves this question, what are we holding on to? What are we holding on to that God wants us to let go of? Then last week, I asked you this one. What does God really want from me? What does he really, really want from me? Well, we know in Romans 12, 1 and 2 that he wants all of us. So what does he really want from me? And what's it going to take for me to get there? So we talked about not conforming to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of our minds. So as we continue this, I'm going to ask you another question this morning. And here's the question. What does God want me to be? They're putting it up on the screen. What does God want me to be? Will you say this question with me? Because I want you to ask yourself as we dig through this. Are you ready? What does God want me to be? Now that's a hard question. I remember when um, our children were in high school, probably starting about, I don't know, ninth, 10th grade. Um, People would begin to ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? What what do you want to be when you grow up? Where do you want to go to college if you want to go to college? What college are you going to go to? What are you going to major in? What are you going to do? Now, I grew up in Christian school my whole life. And at Christian school, your proper answer was, God's called me to be a preacher or a missionary because that's what God wants to do in all of our lives. Which that isn't true, even though I turned out as a pastor. When I was in Christian school, I didn't like pastors. So, (laughs) joke's on me. So anyway, that was the case. But I remember, especially with my kids, Ninth, 10th, you're talking about 15 and 16 year olds. Can you imagine, maybe some of you are around that age range between 15 and 16, and someone comes to you and asks the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Shoot, I'm 55. I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. 
I still got no idea what God's plans are and how he's going to use me. But when you're that young, people begin to ask you and they expect a 15 and 16 year old to make decisions about their future and what path they're going to make and where they're going to be and what is it that God really wants or what do they really want to do and how are they made up. But here's the thing that's fantastic. See, God already knows you. God already knows what you are made of, all the circumstances that you've been through, all the pains, all the hurts, all the difficulties, all the tragedies, all the traumas, everything that you've walked through, God has been there the entire time. He knows what he wants you to be. What he wants you to do is find out what he wants you to be. So let me read the first couple of verses in Romans 12, and then I'll get into the message this morning so I can catch you up. In Romans 12, 1, Paul said these words. He was writing to Christians that were under persecution in Rome, and he said this. He said, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the problem with the living sacrifice is it keeps crawling off the altar, but that's what God wants. He wants us to continually offer ourselves because this is a holy and pleasing to God, which is our true and proper worship. Then he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So when you're trying to move from the fact that I've got something I'm holding on to, I need to release, and what does God really want from me? He wants us to not conform, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And then he says, when we do that, we'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect Will. Now, I hope that's helped you in the previous weeks. Now we're going to step into that question of what does God want me to be? So in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, Paul continues to write and he says these words. He says, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you. So Paul is basically saying, God told me to say this to you, so I'm saying it to you. He says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober Judgment. Now, there's something interesting in here because if you grew up around church or you grew up around Christianity, and I get some of you may not be there, and that's cool. We're just hoping you're on a journey to find Jesus in this. But I was always taught, don't think of yourself. Don't think about yourself because that'll give you the big, big head and you'll be all prideful. And, but actually, Paul is not only telling us to think of ourselves. He's kind of commanding us to think of ourselves, to look into this and to say, I want you to think of yourself, but I want you to think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to you. So what Paul is saying is, I want you to dig into who you are. What if you discovered... What if you discovered that rooted deep down inside of the heart of your heart are some really, really deep insecurities? What if you discovered that the pains and the hurts and the tragedies and the traumas and the difficulties that you've walked through have created this callous in your life or created this place in your life that is just sitting there and it's keeping you from being who God wants you to be. What if you dug so far into yourself and realized that every pain and everything that you've walked through, that God was seeing it? Because see, he is. Did y'all know that God never closes his eyes? He doesn't have to. He never stops. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. He sees every single thing in our life. The problem is we are limited So when we are walking through things in our life, and and, and I hear you, and I've talked to a lot of you, and I know our church, and I know that there's a lot of you that have been through abuse, and been through abandonment, and been through feeling like you're just not worthy of anything, and you've walked through those things, and those are difficult, but God didn't stop there. God took those things, and and, and when taking those things, God saw the end result, because God wasn't limited back here, and God could say that everything in your life that you've walked through, I've got you ready for what I want you to be Today, what would happen if you could figure that out? What would happen if you truly learned who God wants you to be? See, we're all born with these preconceived things and difficult things in our life, and they turn into these crazy insecurities and these crazy difficulties. For instance, I remember several years ago, it's nobody in here, so if you think I'm talking about you, you are dead wrong. Let me look around. 
Yeah, they're not here. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this. Um, several years ago, I was counseling a, a couple. They were having some marriage troubles, and I was meeting with them. And when I was talking with them, as we were walking through different, different things and some of their struggles, the husband, now listen, ladies, you're going to really want to pay attention to this, all right? The husband actually said out loud to me with his wife sitting next to him, he said, my wife will never leave me because I am the best she's ever had, and she can't do better. Mmm. Mm. I almost felt like the whole female part of our church went, Mm-mm, no, that ain't happening. <laughs> I have never wanted to jump across a desk more than I wanted to jump across the desk when that husband said that. But you know what hurt even worse? That sweet young lady said, He's right. I can't do any better. And and, and I'm like you. I I wanted to get on the top rope, come off with an elbow drop and take him out and be be done with the whole marriage counseling 101. Come on. All right, that's that's how I wanted to do it. Those don't lead to a lot of second sessions in case you're wondering. But um, here's the crazy thing. You know what it revealed in her? It revealed this deep pain and hurt and insecurity that she has in her life. It revealed inside of her that she had no value in and of herself. Now, I'm not going to tell you the rest of their story, but what I began to discover in walking with this couple was the pains and the hurts and the things that were in her life. And she never, ever moved beyond those. She never found who God wanted her to be because she got so stuck in the things that happened to her in her life. And it revealed all of these insecurities. Now, before we beat up the husband, and if he was here, we would take lines smacking him. But um, we're not doing that. But before we beat him up, do you know what that statement revealed in him? Some really deep insecurities. Anybody who would make a statement like that is masking something in their life. We all have them. We all have the difficulties. We all have the insecurities. We all have the things in our life. So when we ask a question like saying, what does God want me to be? The problem is we're stuck in what we've always been. And we've never dealt with the things in our past. We've never dealt with those pains and hurts. So therefore, when we say, what does God want me to be? The only lens you can see it through is through the things that you've been through. And God wants to say to you, you are valued. You are treasured. Matter of fact, listen, listen, if if you go home today, I said this in first service and it just occurred to me again, if you go home today and you stand in front of a full length mirror and you take off all of your clothes, how many of you are going to be insecure? Every one of us. Some of y'all are going, I won't be insecure. Yes, you will. Jump one time. Anything that jiggles, you're insecure about, all right? That's us. We do that. When we, did, we all have insecurities deep down inside of us. We're all in the middle of this. But the fact is, God knew you. You can't get the covers high enough to cover yourself. God knows all that about you, and yet God says this to you. God looks at you and he says, you were worth my son's death. That's what you're worth. And if you want to find out what God wants you to be, you got to get into these things in your past. You've got to get into these insecurities. You've got to dig in there. You've got to find the hurts and the pains and everything that you've gone through and say, God, I recognize you didn't abandon me. You were using this for this and this and this. And I don't want to pass this on. I don't want my kids to carry the same pains and hurts that I did. I'm going to discover who you want me to be. I'm going to become that. I'm going to confess before people. I'm going to talk to my kids. No, I'm not going to tell them every dirty detail of my life and I'm going to let them know that I'm this way and your grandfather was this way and his father was that and this got passed down generation to generation and it stops with you. Find out who you are in God. Find out who you are in Christ. So when Paul says, I want you to examine yourself, I want you to look, I want you to look in your own life with sober judgment, he means be real. He means look in there and dig. Can I tell you where this started? Before I, get, before I go further in Romans, I want, I want to go backwards to a story where probably the majority of us, whether you're a Christian or not or grew up in church or not, you're probably familiar with this one. It's the beginning. It's the book of Genesis. We know in Genesis the Bible teaches us and, and, and it's recorded that in the beginning God created. God created the sun and the moon and the stars and the animals and the snail darters and the giraffes. 
God was having a great day that day. God created all these things, and then finally he created man, and then out of man he created woman. And we know the story that man and woman, when temptation came into the garden through the form of a talking snake, which is crazy, but a snake talking to Eve, and the temptation came, and they gave in. All of a sudden, a relationship was broken, and the very first insecurities, the very first pain, the very first sin and hurt entered into the world. Now watch this. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 This is after the sin had occurred, and they heard the sound of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. There's something about those words in the beginning of verse 8 that always strike me. Because for us reading this, it feels like a sometimes a fairy tale or an old story that you've heard. But those opening words meant that there was something about a particular time of the day when God just had fellowship with his creation. That God would just step in in the cool of the day of the garden. That God said, I want to see you. I want to know you. I want you to know me. I want there to be an unbroken fellowship between your creator and you, the creation. But something happened, and you know what happened. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden at the cool of the day. The man and his wife They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and he said, where are you? Now, I need you to understand, God wasn't playing hide and seek. God knew exactly where they were. God had created every tree and bush and plant and animal and everything that was there. And they weren't hiding from God and God wasn't hiding and looking for them. But when God's saying, where are you? It's as if God is saying to you today, hey, Where are you? What is it that's holding you back? What is it that's keeping you? What is that hidden and unconfessed sin? What is that difficulty in your life? What is that pain that maybe occurred to you when you were a child or a teenager and and that thing that happened and you've never let it go and it's become your excuse and you've turned yourself into an excuse-ridden victim your entire life and every single time you step back into the, uh, the cycle of addiction and pain and hurt, it's because of this right here and, and you just continually do this and you've got your place to blame and you've got your place to go what is it so when God says to Adam and Eve where are you he's not looking for them. he's asking them guys where are you what why is our relationship broken he knows but he needed to hear from his kids verse 10 says and he said This is Adam. I heard the sound of you in the garden. And do you see the words that are underlined? I want you to say these words with me. I heard you in the sound of the garden and I was. Because I was. And I. Myself. God responds to them and he says, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And then if you continue to read, the blame game begins. The man says, well, I wouldn't have eaten if you wouldn't have created this woman. Now, I liked her before then. She's pretty cute. But now that you've done this, it's your fault, God. And when God looks at the woman, the woman says, no, no, you created the snake. It's the snake's fault. So the blame game that continues in our own lives. You know, we play a blame game in our own lives too. Whether it involves someone else, this, this happened to me. If my parents would have been more loving, if they would have bought me lollipops every time they went to the store, I probably wouldn't have turned out to be who I am. And, and daddy used to tell me I'm a princess and I didn't turn out as a princess. I'm just not a princess. So it was my daddy's fault. Listen, you can only blame for so long till you've got to own your own junk and begin to walk through it. So, here's, here's God, and he's saying, where are you guys? And in these three words that I underlined, and I want you to see, because these three words, they are the beginning of where the insecurities and the questions 
begin to form these three words because the, the idea of being afraid and naked and hid, the afraid is, is the part of you that fears exposing yourself. That idea of naked is, is the idea of full exposure. Until this time, Adam and Eve walked in the garden fully exposed to each other. There was nothing to hide, nowhere in no way whatsoever. But at this point, they recognized, I've got to hide something because shame and guilt started to enter into their lives. So what do they do with shame and guilt? They begin to hide themselves. And what What a complete tool of the enemy. When the enemy can open our eyes and he can make us afraid of the things in our past and the things in our lives, he can say, because you're afraid, you need to to not expose yourself. Don't tell anybody where your pain is. Don't walk through your pain. Don't get better. Don't do things in the right way. Don't try to find out who God wants you to be. Instead of exposing yourself, I want you to hide yourself back here. But that is not God's desire for your life. See, God, ultimately, God created you to worship him. And the way we worship him is we become the people that God created us to be. Do you know that if one day you stand before God, the question he's gonna, not going to ask you, not going to ask you is, Why weren't you more like Tony? He's not going to look you in the eyes and say, you attended that man's church for years and you are nothing like him. Why were you not more like him? See, (laughs) every time that you try to be somebody else, you're cheating God out of who God created. God created you to be you. And God made you up in all of these things. And oh, I know it is so, so difficult. And I've talked to so many of you and my heart absolutely crushes when I see people that have gone through difficult, difficult situations of abandonment and abuse, whether that's sexual abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse, or spiritual abuse. There's a lot of adults walking around today and they were absolutely abused by the church and the way that the church taught them that there's a certain way and a certain thing. And they have so much church hurt inside of them that they couldn't hear God if he was standing at their door knocking because they've related God to some bad bad experience in church in their life and I get it and you've walked through all that stuff but you got to understand something God was there and God knew it was going to happen and God was and it's so hard it's so hard when you're walking through difficult things to go God why did you abandon me why did you forsake me why did you let this happen why did this thing happen well the reality is God is a good father And he wasn't just looking at the incident. God was looking way out here in the future. And he knew what he was going to do with that and how he was going to turn that difficulty, that hurt, that pain into his glory. And he was going to use it. And what God wants you to do is he wants you to examine and dig into your life and find those areas. Surrender those places to him. Don't sit back and hide anymore. Expose yourself to other people and to God. Begin to grow. Don't hide and step into who God wants you to be. That's what he wants for you. There's there's a writer, he hasn't written recently, and if you ever read one of this guy's books, he'll tell you, just only buy one of his books, because he continually writes the same thing. Um, His name is John Piper, and John Piper got very famous for this statement several years ago, and they'll put it on the screen for me. This was his statement. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. I, you need to just chew on that. For, I mean, just put it in the crock pot and let it marinate for a while. And understand that the way that we worship and honor God the very most, the very best way you can honor God, the very best way you can worship God is to be exactly who God created you to be. Be that person. Be the one who walks through all the things in their pain. Walks through all the things in their past. Be the person that says, God, I don't understand it all, but I'm still going to be at your feet. I'm still going to worship you. And I'm not giving up. I'm going to find out who you want me to be. That's the person. You know what happens when we come to a place where we are completely satisfied in God and we say, God, I don't understand it all, but I'm satisfied in you. Do you know what happens in heaven? God does one of these. Woohoo! That's my kids right there. Man, they're figuring it out. Look at that. Look at me. I got on their jersey today. I am on their team. I am excited for what they're doing. Man, they are glorifying me because they have found satisfaction in me. And they recognize who they are. And they know that I have not left them, but I am with them. Who does God want you to be? 
The only way to find out is to dig in. Romans 12, 3, I read it a second ago. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think, rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. He continues on, he says, for just, for just, of each, just as each of us has one body. We understand that. There's no having to explain it. We all have one body. You don't have a spare at home. You can't trade it in. You can't trade out parts, although there's parts I'd like to trade out nowadays. You can't do that. For just as each of us has one body and many members, and these members do not all have the same function. Now, Paul addresses this in other books that he wrote. He talks about if everybody was an eye, what would you do with an ear? If everybody was an ear, what would you do with a nose? And if everybody was a finger, and all the, the, he goes through all these different things. But he says this, he says, So in Christ, though we are many parts, we form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. With this recognition comes a desire. Because see, we all want to belong. Oh, you wanted to belong. Maybe you're like me and you got picked last for the kickball line. Anybody ever get picked last for kickball? Anybody? When you get picked last, the first thing you do is you pick up the really hard round ball and you throw it in the face of the person who picked you last. That's what you do. Um, you, you, or you live with the pain. You, you walk through it. See, there's a... Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a recognition inside of each, of each and every one of us that we want to belong to something. Um, we find ourselves in the time of the year right now that if you're a football fan, your team has moved forward. Or if you're like my team, you've made it 29 years in a row without doing anything at all. It won't take you long to figure out who my team is. Um, but we all, we all want to belong to something. So if you like a particular team, I see you guys all the time. Some of you come in and God bless you. Some of y'all wear Panthers jerseys and just God bless you. God, I mean, God really have his blessings on you. But you identify that way. We all want to belong to something. Some of you come in and you're wearing hats and you want to be part of the hat gang. And you're wearing a sweatshirt and you want to be part of the sweatshirt gang. Some of you guys have decided that I know it's 20 degrees outside, but I'm the guy that wears shorts all the time. So it's not cold. And, and your legs are frozen, but you're just cool because you're part of that gang, and that's fun. Some of you are part of the style gang, and you went out and you got you some jeans with some ripped holes in it because you wanted to be part of the ripped hole jean club, and that's what you, we all want to belong. We all have things we want to belong, and I'm not picking on any of it. We just all do that. The reality is God created us for that, and God says that if you are in Christ, he wants you to understand that you belong to part of the family. You're part of the body. God wants you. That's part of who he made you to be. He doesn't want you running off by yourself. He wants you to belong. God says that God has put us together to belong and we all belong to each other. He keeps on in verse 6. He says these words. He says, for we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. In other words, God created you with particular things and particular gifts and personalities and temperaments and the way that God puts you together. In this particular case, he's talking about your spiritual gifts. He says, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. Now, understand when it talks about prophecy, yes, there's a little bit about telling the future, but prophecy more has to do with forthtelling, telling the truth of things. So if you have that gift, do it. If your gift is serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's encouragement, then encourage. If it's giving, then give generously. By all means, if it's to lead, then do it diligently. That means don't be prideful, don't be arrogant, but lead with humility and lead forward. If it's to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. See, the way that you find out what God really wants you to be is you get connected to a group of people. It's, it's such a silly visual illustration to think about the fact that what if this morning, when you woke up and you looked out your window and maybe you had a, a, a thermometer or your heater was kicking on for the 18th time this morning, and you looked out and you said, man, it's going to be cold this morning, and I saw that the low this morning was around 7 or 8 degrees, and you started to get out of the bed. You pulled the covers back because you knew you wanted to get to the 11 a.m. service and you wanted to be here and get your coffee early and get your seat and you prayed the pastor would turn all the heaters on today and he met your request. Um, but you, you did all those things. But what if this morning when you got out of bed, your entire body said, it's time to get up and your foot went, nope, not going to do it. Your foot just kind of rebelled and stuck back underneath the cover and was like, no. And your toes started talking to you. 
Your toes started going, it is too flipping cold outside. We are not going out today. I know you put two pairs of socks on, but somewhere you kicked them off in the middle of the night. We're never going to find them. They're probably with the one sock in the dryer, but they don't exist anymore. So we are not getting out of bed. The foot is staying in the bed. That's silly. Y'all would all be going, I got to call, not the doctor, but the shrink is what I got to call because my foot is talking to me. That's what you would do. Such a silly thing. But what Paul is saying, and again, he says this in other passages and other letters that he's writing, but in particular right here, what he's telling us is we need to understand that we all belong together. If you are somebody who is a follower of Jesus, where God wants you to be is he wants you to be in community. He doesn't want you to try to live life alone. He wants you to be with people, understanding what your gifts are, what your talents are, and using them to follow him and everything that you do. But please, please, please don't miss this this morning. Don't miss that everything that you're holding on to as an insecurity, as a blame, as a reason why, God is standing here saying, I knew that. That's part of your story. I want you to recognize that in all that pain, I didn't leave you. I know it feels like it, and I know that's hard to understand, but I allowed because I wanted you to be here, and I could see the end. You could only see the pain, but I could see the promise at the end. So what do we do? What, what, when we ask the question, what does God want me to be? What do we want to be when we grow up in God? Um, I'm, I'm going to give you some. I'm going to give you some steps. I don't. I don't do this a whole lot. I don't like giving people step one, step two, step three because some of you are rule followers, and you'll go, "Ooh, once I get to step three, then I'm going to be the perfect Christian." Nope, it don't work. Because see, you're going to go to bed tonight, and you're going to wake up with yourself again in the morning, and you're going to be screwed up again tomorrow. So these are not just finish this off. But I do want to get you some things. All right. So here's your steps. Number one is this. I want you to recognize something. You have insecurities in the way you view yourself. You, you do. Just go ahead and acknowledge it. Just go ahead, go home, stand in front of the mirror and say, there's something about me that I don't like. Recognize you have insecurities in the way you view yourself. And then once you see that, gosh, if somehow, man, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. I wish some way, somehow, that I had the ability to just start a line. To just, just start right over here and just start a line from this front row over and have you guys walk past me and me to be able to say, there's the pain in your life. Here's how God's going to use it and this is what you can be. Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't y'all love that if that was my, my gifting? Wouldn't that be cool? Man, I'd have me a TV show. Um, I'd, be, I'd be selling handkerchiefs. Um, everybody be giving money and I have a plane. But anyway, I don't have any of that stuff. It's all good. I don't have that gift and that, that's not me. I can't do that. Um, But I know somebody who can. See, the closer we draw to God, the closer we recognize that inside of us there is some pain, there is some hurt, there are some things that are there, and they've created these insecurities inside of us, and they've created these difficulties. When we begin, when we begin to recognize that we have those, when we begin to stand there and say, God, I feel this way. And when you're standing in front of the mirror and saying, I have an insecurity, please hear God whisper. I never left you. I created you. I'm right here with you. And I see what can come out of it. Trust me. Walk with me. Get around other people. Speak your hurts. Let other people speak their hurts. Let other people speak their deliverance and you speak yours as well as God brings you and he provides healing and wellness in your life. Let him do that. So, recognize you have insecurities in the way you view yourself. Begin to view yourself the way God sees you. And that's hard. That is really hard. Somebody said to me after the first service, I was sitting and talking to them, and they said to me, I have never seen myself the way God sees me. Oh, if you ever have a doubt, if you ever have a doubt, God sees you as so important that he gave up his child and said, I will allow the wrath of and the sin of the world to be dispensed on my child because you're worth it. That's how God views you. So many, yeah, so many Christians 
They just haven't recognized that in their lives. They just haven't come to a place and they continue to sit back and say, but you don't know my story, but you don't know my hurt, but you don't know these difficulties. And God's just sitting there going, I do, but you're worth it. So number one, recognize you have insecurities. The way you view yourself, begin to view yourself the way God does. Number two is this, discover the unique gifting that God has placed in your life. And, and listen, the Bible talks about spiritual gifts. And again, 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, there's other places that dig into spiritual gifts a little bit more. This one here in Romans talks a little bit about spiritual gifts. If you want to find out more about what your spiritual gift is in Christ, there's a thousand gift surveys you can do. We've done them here at our church. We can give them to you. That's really, really cool. Um, but part of finding out what your gift is is to do something. Start, start just doing something. Start going, hey, God, I'm going to give this a shot. I'm going to move this forward. I'm going to step forward. Maybe look and do that examination and recognize in your life, what are the pains and hurts that I've walked to and where does God brought me to where I am now? But you need to discover the unique gifting that God has placed in your life. And then the third one is kind of simple. Once you've done this, you need to, um, you need to use it. You need to use your gift in the body of Christ. So this, this is not, don't, don't feel like this is a, you know, the entire message was about getting you to serve in the nursery. No, it's not. I don't know what your gifting is. I, I know that when you drove in the parking lot this morning, there were some guys out in the parking lot that were directing traffic. Did y'all know how cold it was outside in the parking lot? Do you know where I wasn't this morning? Out in the parking lot. Okay. I'm not saying that God uniquely qualified those guys with an extra layer of hair sweater or, or body fat or whatever it may be to make them warmer. I'm just saying they decided they were going to find a place to serve, so they stepped in and served. Thank you, guys. The ones that made the coffee this morning, God bless them. Amen. Let's say, here we go. Some of y'all got real spiritual on that one. All right. Um, use your gift, whatever it is. In the body of Christ, and yes, when we talk about the body of Christ so often, and it's, it's true, we're talking about our local church, living water. We, we're going to, in, in a minute, I'm going to make an announcement about our ownership class. We have an ownership class. We call our members owners here because members expect things and owners invest, and we want you to invest as an owner here at Living Water. We want you to get involved every Sunday between the first and second service at 1010. We have a 1010 meeting for all of our volunteers. Sometimes there's more volunteers at the 1010 meeting than there are in the first service, and that's cool. That's fine, but the idea of that is to build that together and recognize that we're all here in the body body of Christ and we have gifts and we have things we can use. And that's the way we talk about it. But also understand that if you give your life to Jesus, if you are a Christian, you are part of the universal body of Christ, which means God's gifted you. It means you got to look for opportunities. You got to use your gifts. You got to use everything. And yes, this is particularly talking about spiritual gifts, but what about the ways that God taught you to do things? The the experiences that God allowed you to walk through? How are you using them? You need to use them for the body of Christ. And then I'm going to wrap up with um, it, it's a statement that I, you know, guys know I like to give statements, but it's kind of more of a prayer than it is a statement. Will y'all put that up on the screen for me, the very next slide? Um, it's this, it's to be the new that God wants me to be, I have to know who he made me to be. And, and I don't, it seems simple, but maybe it seems complicated, but if you're going to be the new, if you're going to step into this new and be out with the old and you want to know who it is God wants you to be, then you have to know who he made you to be. And you're like, well, that sounds kind of redundant. No, it doesn't. Because the only way you're going to know that is to recognize that everything you've walked through, God's been there and he's walking with you to discover it and then to use it. So I, I'm going to ask you to do something. I did this in first service, felt like the Holy Spirit wanted me to do it. I'm, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to ask you if, if you're not hindered, will you stand up with me? Will you stand up with me? Because um, I, I, I'm going to get you to say this like you're saying a prayer. Not like you're saying a prayer, but say it as a prayer to God. Uh, last Monday, a lot of you started 21 days of prayer and fasting in our church. Uh, we are corporately praying and fasting together that God would, would bless our church, that he would grow our church both numerically and spiritually and every other area that that means. We're also praying for things in your lives, things that God can change in you. You're asking yourself the question, God, what is it? What is it that's between me and you? What is it I need to set aside? I want you to add something. Um, a lot of you are doing the devotions of the 21 days of prayer and fasting. Some of you are reading through the Bible this year. Fantastic. I encourage you to do that. For the next week, I want you to add this. Just, just this next week. 
Every, if you do your quiet time in the morning, afternoon, night, whatever it is, here's what I want you to do. You can take a picture of this. You can go to the, to the uh, website and get it um, or just write it down, whatever you want to do. Here it is. We're, we're going to do this as a prayer to God. I want you to say it with me, all right? Because I want you to do this every day this week. This is how, how I want you to do it. You ready? God, to be, the, to be the new that God wants me to be, I have to know who he made me to be. That's how I want you to start your prayers this week. I want you to take a very simple statement and just say, God, if I'm going to be the new that you want me to be, I have to know who you made me to be. And then dig. And part of that is knowing you. Part of that is recognizing the things in your life that have been hard and difficult and knowing that God is there and he wants to walk with you. Let me pray. God, I love you. I pray that this morning that uh, first of all, God, if there's anybody here that is not a follower of you, that they will fully recognize this morning that life is empty without you and they need to surrender their life to you. God, that is the gospel in a nutshell that we recognize the good news that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless life, he was the son of God, that he died sinless and three days later he rose again for our sins so that we could have an eternity and a hope for the future. And for today, God, if there's anybody here today that has never surrendered their life to you, I pray that today's the day they do that and they begin to walk in the hope of who you are. And God, there's bound to be somebody here this morning that the reason they haven't given their life to you is because of all the pains and they don't understand how a good God can allow bad to happen. Um, But God, help them to recognize this morning you've never left them, you've never forsaken them, and you're there. And then for those of us who call ourselves Christians, followers of you, God, may we take our next steps and not hold on to things from the past, to let go of the old and step into the new that you have for us. God, may we be who you want us to be in the ways you want us to be. We love you. It's in your name we pray.